Thanks for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast. If you like what you hear today, be sure to like it, share it, review it, and subscribe. Also, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok for regular updates on upcoming episodes. Today, we're brought to you by Metro Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, and Ram at Chicopee. Check out their state-of-the-art dealership next to BJ's and Big Y on Memorial Drive. Or check out MetroJeep.com and drive home in your new Metro Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, Ram today. And now, here's today's episode of Baxi's Musical Podcast. Baxi's Musical Podcast. Three sisters, it's useless. I'm pretty sure that most of us have heard the old saying that good things come to those who wait. But since we're an impatient species prone to instant gratification in an on-demand world, Many of us tend to ignore that old saying because we want things now. Sure, some of us are willing to wait things out, but for how long? I mean, I don't have all day here. I got stuff to do. But on the other hand, you could be the guy that everyone is waiting for. When's your book coming out? When are you going to get a job? When are you going to leave? Imagine listening to those annoying questions every single day. Now imagine hearing it for the last 25 years. Those questions are not so different from the ones that have been asked of Matt Johnson for the last quarter century. Matt Johnson is the leader and driving force behind the band The The. From 1983 to 2000, Matt Johnson and The The released six incredible albums which featured 15 singles, seven of which reached the British Top 40. Among them included 1983's international hit This Is The Day, followed up by Uncertain Smile, which were arguably two of the best singles of the entire decade. The next three albums infected from 1986, 1989's Mind Bomb, and 1993's Dusk moved higher and higher on the UK charts. Ironically, this was never a band that was motivated by chart success. Instead, Matt Johnson's music has always been more defined by much deeper themes than typical chart toppers. This is a richly powerful body of music that combines deep social observations, politics, as well as incredibly thoughtful imagery. And while Matt Johnson appears to be a one-man show, his music has benefited greatly from countless collaborations. These include appearances from David Johansson from the New York Dolls, Sinead O'Connor, Lloyd Cole, Mark Allman from Soft Cell, Jules Holland, and many others. The music of Matt Johnson is the sort of stuff that makes your life better. It just does. Unfortunately, the last time that Matt Johnson released original material for The The was in 2000 with the album Naked Self. After that, Johnson would concentrate on other projects, film scores, broadcasting, and publishing. He's also been involved in local activism, and during that time, he rarely granted interviews. He just lived his life, and it wasn't always so simple, including threats to his own health and the passing of several family members. And while he would be the subject of the 2017 documentary Inertia Variations, his last music release was a collaboration with Johnny Marr of the Smiths entitled We Can't Stop What's Coming. This was his first single in 15 years, a single which he dedicated to his brother Andy, who had died the previous year. In 2018, Matt Johnson announced that he would be reforming the band and would set out on a world tour. Finally, after 25 years, Matt Johnson has released a stunning new record entitled Insolment, a record which is as powerful and as beautiful as anything else that The The has ever released. He's also currently on tour of the U.S., including a date at the Orpheum in Boston on October 19th. Like I said, Matt Johnson does not grant many interviews, so the chance to speak to him was an amazing treat. This is my interview with Matt Johnson from The The on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Hello. Hey, Matt. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very, very good. This is such a joy to speak to you. i I got to be... Perfectly honest. I know you don't, you don't grant a, a, a lot of interviews, so I'm very honored to have you here today. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how's the weather where you are? Um, very typical autumn day. Good. Yeah. Well, I'm in Atlanta at the moment, and it's mm. beautiful weather. It's uh, perfect temperature. Uh, they say it's cooler than it normally is, but it's uh, it's beautiful. Very well, really beautiful. There are certainly worse places to be this week. That's for <laughs> that's for sure. Weather wise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I have to assume that over the last 25 years, you have been hounded with people asking you questions about when you're going to release the next record. And I, and, and I, and I have to believe that 
you're hearing this every day, every week. I, I don't want to be the guy that asks you that question about what took you so long. I want to be the guy that asks you this. When's the next record coming out? Oh, <laughs> now that is a tricky question. See, I, I don't mark, know my own mind half the time. I never know if I'm going to do another record quickly or take some. It's all very, very spontaneous. So I really don't know. Um, but it's a good question, though. I have to believe that you know you you do get tired of the of the questions of the inquiry about uh, you know where things have been. I mean, it's certainly not like you haven't been doing things, you know, along the way. I, I guess the the real question is is why now? I, you you certainly address it in the, in the album, but in in your own words, what was it about these times that motivated you to say it's time and it's time to do it now? Well, there was a documentary that came out a few years ago. Uh, I don't know whether you saw it. It's called the the Inertia Variations. And that sort of explained uh, the situation. It was directed by my one of my ex-partners, who's a Swedish documentarian, uh, Johannes St. Michaels. And it's a complicated story, really, because we, we lived together in, in New York in the uh, 1990s. And when we left New York, we moved to Sweden. And it was after I'd released Naked Self and... Um, I did a massive world tour around about that. And I was very, I just got very, very tired and burnt out after that because unlike a lot of my contemporaries, I, I started extremely young. I was in bands from about the age of 11 or 12. By the age of 15, I was working in a recording studio in London's West End. By the age of 17, I formed a the. So by by the by the year 2000, you know, I'd, I'd had a quite a full-on, full-length career and I was very burnt out. We left New York, moved to Sweden, had my first son in New York, and he was growing up in Sweden. And I, I got very, I just felt very tired, very burnt out. I didn't want to put records out just for the sake of putting them out. Sure. Um, I, I felt that sort of cheating the audience, you know. I, I mean, financially, it might be lu uh, lucrative, you know, just to <laughs> churn records out and go on tour. But the audience, no, I, I, I treat the audience with respect, and I think they would know if I was cheating them or cheating myself. And so I have a lot of interest outside of music. I, I get involved in conservation work in terms of building conservation and uh, local politics, which was time consuming and a bit of a waste of time, really. I got involved in uh, uh, book publishing and, and film soundtrack work and did a lot of traveling. And it, it, it took a while just to get my energies back and my passions back um for music and and with this record i felt um it was the right time to do it. i really felt i had something new to say i felt passionate about music again working with people that i love working with i was looking forward to going out and meeting the audience again and so i just felt felt like i felt when i first started out and i'm happy the way things have worked out and i don't view it as 25 years lost because in that <laughs> 25 years i had a couple of children and uh, spent a lot of time traveling, doing lots of very interesting things. And um, I feel quite rejuvenated now, actually. It's, it's interesting when you read reviews of the record or talk to other fans who, who have heard installment. You know, they all kind of say this was worth the wait. That even if it was 25 years, it didn't feel like the, the lost a step or you lost a step. It really does fit in very nicely with you know, the, the rest of the, uh, the, the body of work. As I've been listening to it, I've been listening to it a lot over the last you know, couple of weeks. It's such a stunningly beautiful record that is just loaded with a bunch of very furious themes. And I love that. But I think the real value of this record is there seems to be a real urgency to the message. You know, it's, it's very much a, a reflection of our time. It's, it's not so unlike you know, what Infected was 38 years ago. Tell me about that and, and, and about taking this opportunity to reflect what you're, you're seeing in the world. Um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the response that the album's had, first of all, because you never know. We put a lot of heart, a lot of soul, a lot of passion in this record. And it's quite a nocturnal record in some ways. It's quite a gentle, thoughtful record. And it's I'm my, the age that I am now. I'm not going to pretend that I'm 25 and <laughs> leaping about, you know, and I've had a lot of life experience, a lot of wonderful things, a lot of sad things, like like all of us do when we get to a certain age, we would have experienced bereavement as well as you know the birth of our children and the ups and downs of life and so 
there's that internal aspect about my own personal life. But of course, the, as you as you refer to, the world we're living in now is very, very strange. And um, I certainly wanted to comment on that. And there's a, there's a wonderful quote that I often think about, um, refer to, is the great Nina Simone once said that every artist has a duty to reflect the times that they live in and that's what I've tried to do throughout my career you know with albums like Infected and and uh, Mind Bomb and, and all the others really and with this one um, although predominantly out of the 12 songs I'd say probably 80 percent 70 percent are very personal they're about life and loss and love and longing but the, the, uh, there is a percentage, a smaller percentage of the songs, which are quite political, particularly songs like Cognitive Dissident, which is the opening track of the album, which is um, really a re reference to uh, the Orwellian times we're living through. Um, it sort of references 1984 in terms of, um, you know, uh, war is peace, etc., which was these all or Orwellian terms, double speak, double think, new speak, new think, whatever it was. It's a really interesting song, the way you know the, the lyrics you know contradict each other to show you know the the irony of of it all and the and the divisiveness of you know how we are reacting to each other, how we're you know locked in devices, how we're either right or wrong or left or right. and it's it, it's yeah. it's really a, a, a fascinating way to open up the record. It's a wonderful, wonderful song, but it does really reflect how the world is today, and it is so much different than it was five years ago than now. It's astonishing, really. And then you've got, and, and I know in the U.S. as well as the U.K., the rise of cancel culture. So people are terrified of expressing themselves. Even innocent thoughts can be misconstrued and twisted against them. And so this cancel culture has become predominant and people are starting to self-censor. They're um, overthinking or not thinking or trying not to think, trying not to express themselves. And the divisiveness, I mean, that's one of the oldest tricks in the book, of course, isn't it? Divide and rule, where you have everybody at each other's throats and then the people that really control things are able to carry on doing what they're doing and having the rest of us uh, bickering and arguing and fighting over certain things that maybe aren't so important. But um, we've we've seen, I suppose, also wanted to, in a track like Kissing the Ring of Potus and the, and the line, the coup that nobody noticed in that song, is really referencing the neoconservative, neoliberal takeover that's happened in Western democracies the last few decades. What I would refer to as the extreme centre, you know, the very, very pro-war, pro-privatisation, as in transferring wealth from from the the working classes and the middle classes to the extremely uh, the small percentage of extremely wealthy people, and this has gone on all over uh, the Western democracies, and this is something that is causing huge, huge problems, and that somehow it's seen to be normal to be extremely pro-war. You know, the terrible suffering that we see going on around the world, and we all seem to be powerless to do anything against it. Certainly, our governments don't seem to represent the will of the populations. They just represent the will of a small minority of powerful interests. There's a number of very intriguing songs on, on this record, and, and a couple I want to ask you about. The, the first one would be Some Days I Drink My Coffee by the Grave of William Blake. You know, I, I know, first of all, it's, it's something you've actually done, had coffee by by that grave, but you, know, there's a, you talk about that the London you knew was gone, and then it goes further than that, where it really does seem to have a lot of applicability to what goes on here in, in the States. And, you know, there's a lot of disenchantment that people have with how our governments are run and how our leaders are selected and, and the corruptibility of government. Tell me where that sentiment comes from within you. I mean, obviously this has motivated you to write about it and to, and to comment on it. Tell me about, you know, where your feelings are on all of that. Well, I grew up, um, in, in a family, working class family, and my father was very politically aware. He he was um, an old school Labour supporter. And this is where the Labour Party in the UK, which I suppose would have been the equivalent of the old Democrat Party, you know, it's, it's essentially it's, you know, more representative of working people. Um, but they've been co-opted, they've been infiltrated to the degree, you know, you had someone in the UK, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair, for instance, 
New Labour in the 1990s, who was very much the heir to Margaret Thatcher's. So what's happened is in the Western democracies is a lot of the, the, the old parties that you felt were anti-war and stood for social justice and fairness got infiltrated by the by the same people that had infiltrated the, the more right wing parties. Um, where I stand on things, I think I think I'm a moderate in the old sense, in that I'm I'm anti-war. I'm just pro-social justice and fairness. Um, I don't like. Uh, I'm also pro-freedom of speech and freedom of expression, and people just treating each other with respect and kindness. I mean, I, I, this all seems to be common sense to me, but those sort of old-fashioned moderate views are now <laughs> seen as ex- extremist. You know, if you're if you're not rabidly pro-war, you're seen as somehow suspicious. Um, but we have similar things that have happened in the UK as in the US. We've had got a new government uh, led by Keir Starmer, um, Sir Keir Starmer, who's really the heir to Tony Blair, I suppose. It's the Labour Party. But, you know, the, the, their foreign policy is identical to the to the Conservative Party, i.e. more pro, more war, 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 war. This sort of infantile posturing uh, that somehow if you prove that you're you're prepared to sort of bomb lots of innocent people that somehow you're 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 tough or you're strong the problem with politics in, in, in particularly in the US but in, in the UK is 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 the money the lobbyists there's just too much yeah. lobbying there's too many powerful interests that have infiltrated it and the politicians as you said earlier they're selected they're not elected or they're selected before they're elected so it's it's completely corrupt. It's completely infiltrated. What? And ordinary people, you want ordinary people. And there, there's that's why you get things like Brexit or the popularity of someone like Trump, because people are so frustrated with the system. And because Trump, when he first appeared, he promised to drain the swamp that appealed to a certain amount of people because they're sick of uh, you know, in the UK, they're sick of, of, of West, the Westminster bubble. And the same, I suppose, applies in the in the US, the amount of corruption and most people want a change, but they don't know there's no one to turn to. Right. And someone like Trump initially probably promised to drain the swamp. And when as soon as he was in power, of course, then he appointed people like, you know, Bolton and Pompeo, you know, the, the very hardcore neocons. So you can't ordinary people are very frustrated because they can't trust anybody. The media is taken over. It's owned by the same people as the probably uh, you know the arms manufacturers and the pharmaceutical companies, and people they don't know where to turn. They can't trust anybody, which is when why you then get the rise in alternative media, uh, and even that gets infiltrated. And so people aren't foolish. They should they trust their intuition, their instinct. They know they're being lied to all the time, and they're being manipulated. They're being set against each other, and that's where we are. It's a very but I but I don't want to be too negative because. I do have faith in people, you know, vast majority of people I come across and I meet a lot of people uh, in my line of work are are good people, really kind, decent people. And I'd say 98 percent of humanity, they're kind, they they want what's best for themselves and their family, but also their friends and just and the society at large. People are decent inherently. But unfortunately, there's a tiny percentage of um, psychopaths that rise to positions of power that cause problems for the rest of us. I mean, I, I agree with that on a, on a lot of different levels. First of all, I think that like in the United States, our two-party system is inherently corrupt because neither party represents actual people other than themselves and the acquisition and, and, and the maintenance of, of power. But what I really do agree with you on, and I do I do also hear a sense of hopefulness in the in the record too, but but certainly in the, in this conversation. That you know, people are generally inherently good, and that we all want similar things, but we also have different things that are pulling us in one direction or another. You know, it is very hard in the United States to find what the truth is, what you know, what real information is, because you know we're not looking at traditional sources of news anymore. We're looking at our phones, and our phones yeah. are, are basically turned into a giant cesspool of ideas, and and many of yeah. those ideas are are fabricated and falsehoods. So. We're in a very mm-hmm. difficult time trying to figure out, well, you know, what what should we be thinking about and you know, what are the, the truths of the world? Yeah. I mean, echo chambers, and we're all guilty of that, of reinforcing our own prejudices through 
echo chambers, you know, and in, and in, you know, years ago when newspapers were, were more powerful, you, you may pick up a newspaper and you would come across articles that you wouldn't necessarily be seeking out, but you would come across more diverse range of information, even if some of it was, of course, propaganda, I suppose. But these days, I guess many of us, all of us possibly, we tend to gravitate towards news outlets which do reinforce our own points of view, which is not necessarily a healthy thing, of course, because this exacerbates this divisiveness, this yeah. polarisation that's going on. And I think, you know, in, in simple terms, I think we live in a world full of so many distractions. You know, I know we all struggle with their, getting our kids off of their phones and <laughs> the, the screen age, as we call them. Um, it's so predominant and it's so difficult. I mean, one one thing I personally try to do is have periods where I just don't, you know, I, don't have, I haven't had a television for 25 years and I do watch films and stuff like that and i i try to have a certain amount of time without distractions just to sit and think and i think all of us need to have time to to get to know ourselves better and to get to um in, in touch with our own intuition and our own filter system and cliched things like even getting closer to nature and spending time alone just to really think is is a good way of cleansing um our, our, our instincts right i think because otherwise we are really the victim of so much manipulation and propaganda and as you say it's a and social media particularly is is a cesspool it's 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 awful a lot of it and i think to try to discipline ourselves to have personal discipline in our own lives and limit the amount of stuff that we expose ourselves to and and enhance our own personal relationships, physical relationships with friends, with family, and think, have thinking time to really listen to the sound of our own thoughts. Because I find, you know, wherever you go, there's music playing, like you go to in a, in a taxi, you go to a shop, to a restaurant, there's distraction all the time. Almost we're being distracted from our own thoughts. I think it's good to have time just to to clear, clear the head, clear the heart, and really figure out, think, and feel, start to feel as well as think what you want in life, uh, what's important to you, um, and just see what comes to the surface. You mentioned how much of this record is more personal than political, and and it's very very true. And 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 one of the the songs, which kind of in a way kind of dabbles with both, but certainly probably more personal in the way it was uh, inspired from, was "Linoleum Smooth to the Socking Foot." It's a it's a fascinating story in in the sense that you were hospitalized and and very very ill during the time of the pandemic. Tell me about that situation because I mean the, in what I've read so far, it sounds like you were very very close to dying. Yes, um, I was unfortunately, and it was a bizarre thing really because the pandemic had just uh, reached fever pitch, and and I came down with this very a bad throat infection i thought it was just a, a regular sore throat or maybe even tonsillitis but it turned out to be a, an abscess quite a serious abscess in the pharynx and it grew and grew and it was the only way i could describe it, it was like having a small python wrapped around your windpipe you know squeezing me and i ended up getting rushed to hospital and then rushed to another hospital and they um recommended i have the operation basically have my throat cut open to drain the abscess and I was very resistant to this because I kept saying look I'm a singer I was I was very worried it would affect my voice and they got to the point after I resisted for a few days they said this is no longer about tone of voice this is about life and death you know we could have 30 minutes to get to you and we won't be able to get you in time and basically you're going to be dead and so then uh, once I was told that of course I I agreed and went ahead with the operation and in the aftermath of the operation it was quite intense because of the morphine you know anyone that's had morphine knows what that's like it's uh and there's very various other medications and very strong um antibiotics on a drip and so it put me in a very strange state of mind which was exacerbated magnified by the weirdness in the hospital with everybody being masked up i wasn't allowed visitors and the hospital parts of it were closed it seemed dark it seemed cold it was a very very strange experience and it put me in mind there was a brilliant Tarkovsky film called Solaris where they're up on this spaceship and it's everything's very strange and hallucinogenic and it felt a bit like that it felt very weird 
and I thought I had to um, try to create a positive out of a negative. And so I thought, let's let's start writing. So as I was wandering around the corridors or lying in the bed, and I started to write linoleum smooth to the stocking foot, which was about that experience. You've been involved in a lot of other things, in particular, you know, during your hiatus, the Cineola label for, for soundtracks and spoken word projects, also Radio Cineola. But one of the things that, that was really intriguing to me was the publishing company, the, the 51st State Publishing. And one of the first things that, that you released was the, the memoir of your father. And, and interestingly enough, in, in the album, you wrote about the, the loss of your father. I had to believe that both projects had to be extraordinarily I don't know if, if difficult or emotional had you know, is, is the right word, but they had to be very powerful to to do both, to have a, a hand in, in, in reflecting both of those situations. Yeah, well, that, that, with the book, he, because my dad wanted to be a writer and he wrote lots of short stories over the years. He, he was a lovely man. I loved my dad. And he, he worked in the docks uh, when he was younger, which was uh, the East London docks, was quite a tough place to work. Then he was, he was obviously a publican running with my mother and uh, his brother, what was became East London's most famous music pub. And so there was all these great stories. And then he wanted to, he was writing them down. And I thought, you know, for his 80th birthday as a present, I decided to, I'd edit it and publish it. <laughs> so I created a small book publishing company and it, it went, did very well. I got him on national radio and we did big um, speaking events and, and, and lots of interviews and interesting publications. And he went very, very well. And the book sold pretty well, actually. So that was a really lovely thing, nicest present I ever gave to my dad. Probably one of the nicest presents he ever had, really. And he absolutely yeah. loved it, um, being in the position to tell all these wonderful stories. And the book is still selling today. And um, what happened in terms of then writing the song for him, it was during the last tour, which was the Comeback Special Tour in 2018. Unfortunately... Uh, it was two days before we were about to play the Royal Albert Hall in London. Uh, my, my father died. And so I had to carry on performing, of course. And I remember being at the Royal Albert Hall and looking up at the box where he would have been sitting. And it was very, very emotional. It was a very difficult thing to do. But, you know, you, you, I'm a professional singer and performer and, and, you, and you have to compartmentalise you, I'm certainly not the only person that's been in that position, you know, sure. sports people and performers, you know, you just, you have to find a way of getting on with it. But um, writing this album, um, yeah, because I've written songs, I've lost now four members of my immediate family. I've lost two brothers, my mother and then my dad. And I've written songs for all of them. And the most, and I hope I don't write any, have to write any more of these songs. Sincerely, I hope that. But I wrote... Uh, where do we go when we die for my dad you know and it, it's the song that's it's a very emotional song but it's it's hopeful in that it really I'm writing about what I believe you know the cycles of life and rebirth and and um, the the eternal nature of the soul and that's what I believe uh, whether I'm right or wrong it's just my my feeling my belief and I wanted to put that into into song form and I, I really i love singing that song live actually and although it's a new song it, it does get re, it gets re, very received it, re, it gets received very well live yeah it's a beautiful song and the fact that you have been so involved and and not just you know as a son but you're telling you <laughs> presenting your dad's story when i when i when i read that and put them two and two together i thought who doesn't wish they could do that for their own father, you know, to, to give them that opportunity to, to tell their story and then to honor them c continuing on even after they pass. That's what, just a, what a yeah. wonderful thing to have done. No, oh, thank you. I yeah. appreciate your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to, I also read another uh, interview that, that you had done and I think, I thought this was like so interesting. So I'm of the age where, you know, in 1983, I would have been, that would have been like my, uh, the, the beginning of my senior year in high school. And uh, soul mining was a big record for us, and, uh, and and certainly for me and my friends. And to me, you know, this is the day is one of the most amazing songs ever. And to me, that just screams out the '80s to me. That just you know puts me back in in that place. And the thing that's so interesting about it is to hear you talk about that song now, and and how over the years the meaning of that song has changed so dramatically for you, and that it has aged 
better in a, in a lot of ways for you than than maybe when you wrote it when you were still in your in your your twenties. Tell me about how that song has aged positively for you. Well, I'll tell you an interesting story. This is just just several weeks ago, actually, or a couple of months ago. My younger brother Gerard, who's who's a film director, of films I score. We we've been we just recently sold our father's our late father's house. He died six years ago, Ed, but we were very sentimental. We didn't get rid of the house straight away because it was full of so much stuff, so many old belongings from our mother, our father, our two brothers, um, and we couldn't face doing it. But recently we we did do it. We put that house up for sale, so we had to clear it out. And we were going through boxes of things, and I came across all these old letters that written by my younger brother, Eugene, the one who died when he was 24, letters that he wrote to one of his girlfriends and, and letters that she wrote back. And I'd never seen these letters before, and they were so emotional. And I sat there reading some old letters, crying, you know, thinking about my family, about my life. And as I sat there on the floor reading these letters and crying, I thought, my God, I'm in This Is The Day <laughs> in my own song. You know, and it, it was fascinating to me because... When I re re released that song originally, we did a video, made a video, and I wasn't very keen on the video because it was shot on video itself, not on film. I didn't like the look of it. But what was valuable to me about that video is that it included all members of my family, my dad, my mum, all my brothers, <laughs> and my girlfriend at the time. And four of those people are no longer here anymore. And so the song becomes more and more poignant. Um, and in fact, it was written, but I wrote it when I was about 20, which was strange, really. I, I was a young person and just starting off. I didn't realise that that song, I'd still be singing it 40 years down the line, <laughs> and it would have even greater meaning for me. Um, but there it is, and that's, I suppose, the sign of a, it is my most successful song, yeah. and not necessarily my best, but certainly my most successful and most well-known. And it's become a standard, I suppose, in that other people cover it. It gets used in films and adverts. and um, be nice if i wrote a few more of those that would become standards but at least i've written one you know to come back after so many years i know you've been you've been touring for the last couple of years this isn't you know something that's just happening you know then in 2024 so part of this tour is you're performing in Solment, you know in its entirety and then you're know, doing you know the hits but in, in coming back and and performing how does it feel to be back on stage to be singing songs like you know this is the day or 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 you know, you know some of the others, and 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 then to introduce them to a whole new set of the the songs. I mean, how how does that register with you after all this time? Well, we, it was tricky. With um, I made the decision to to play the whole of the new album as the first set, and and it's a tricky one really for the audience because they don't know those songs so well. I mean, they're starting to know them obviously because the album's been out a few weeks, but. To, to, to make them sit through a whole album of, of songs they don't know that well. But the, the audiences have been very, very responsive so far, which has been wonderful. They've been listening. And I do say the first set is really the listening set. The second set is the dancing set. And in terms of the other set and the songs that we play, I've tried to represent each of the albums, even going back to Blurning Blue Soul and up to Naked Self as well. So there's at least one song from each of the albums. And, and during the rehearsal period, I do try a lot of different songs and I, I only can include songs that I really feel that I can do justice to and sing with meaning, you know, and I don't want to just be on a stage going through the motions. And so I do emotionally feel connected to all of the songs that I'm singing. Obviously I'm not 25 years old anymore. I don't <laughs> run around the stage like I used to when I was 25, but I, I think that's unseemly. I think it's very important to have the dignity uh, to act your age, whatever age you are, you know, and I think and, and I'm now singing to an older audience as well as to a younger audience. There are younger people that like my stuff as well, of course. And I think you have to express from where you are at this moment. You've got to be sort of truthful. This is who I am at this moment in time. This is where I am. This is what I feel. This is what I think. And then you have to just to be true to yourself. I think after 43 years, even when I hear your music, I got to sit down. <laughs> uh, yeah. I can't run. I can't run like I used to. Not at this age. No, no. You're going to be in Boston uh, at the Orpheum on October 19th. It's going to be a great show, Matt. It is. It is a real honor and a joy to talk to you today. I I love the. I mean, I've I've got all your records, but I I really do enjoy the new one. It's such a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much. 
Oh, I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed the interview and I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm great questions and uh, lovely to speak to you and um, looking forward to Boston as always. Thank you, Matt. Take care. Thank you. You take care. The name of the new album from The The is called Installment. And like I said, Matt, the band will be in Boston at the Orpheum Theater on October 19th. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you can always email me at bax at rock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. Thanks to Metro Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram and Chickabee for their support. But most of all, thanks to you for listening to Baxi's musical podcast.